Hi, everyone. Welcome to our career panel. We're going to be discussing the impact of emerging technologies, which is being presented by the UCLA Alumni Los Angeles Westside Network. Uh, my name is Morgrade and I serve as the network's career chair and we organize various career panels and other uh, networking events for Bruins who live and work on the west side. I encourage you to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn at UCLA Westside to stay connected and learn more about our events. We will have, a, have another event upcoming on Friday, May 8th for a networking uh, casual. Okay, so today we're going to be going, uh, going to be structuring it as 45 minutes of content where we're going to discuss some of the issues. Then we're, we will leave some time for Q&A at the end. And we already have received some questions and you can also ask us other questions in the Q&A function, which we will address time permitting. Uh, in a follow-up email after the webinar, we will share a survey for feedback as well as links to our future events. And this webinar is being recorded for sharing to the UCLA alumni YouTube page. Okay, so I'm gonna start with intros. As I said, my name is Morgrate Salipur. I am a business and tech lawyer. I work with individual entrepreneurs and businesses to help them with forming their businesses and negotiating and drafting their contracts and tech transactions. And I work with emerging tech companies among my practice, including companies that use uh, technology such as AI, blockchain, IoT, among others. I have with me today Barbara Bickham, and I'll let her do a quick introduction on herself. Thanks, Morvid. Uh, my name is Barbara Bickham. I am the founder and CTO at Trail and Ventures. Trail and Ventures uh, helps put companies on blockchain, so we work with entrepreneurs and companies to help uh, with their emerging tech implementations. The other thing I do is I'm the managing director of the Women's Innovation Fund and Accelerator. Uh, we do three things there. We help create sustainable companies. We are a gender balanced uh, fund, so you have to have kind of an equal amount of men and women at the sea level. And then we help emerging tech companies, uh, AI, blockchain, IoT, kind of industry agnostic, um, kind of move from point A to point B. So that's what we do uh, there. Well, Welcome, Barbara. Thanks for being here with me today. So I know Barbara through the Women in Tech space, and it's always a good conversation. So we decided to let you guys kind of enjoy our conversation today and take part with us. So uh, Barbara, given your CTO kind of position in the space, can you maybe briefly describe, you know, AI, blockchain, IoT for our uh, listeners? Sure. So let me describe uh, blockchain first. That's the easiest one for me to describe. Uh, so blockchain is four things. It's, uh, it's uh, encrypted, which is private and protected, distributed or um, decentralized, not in all one location. It's uh, immutable, permanent record, and it's a ledger, debit and credit. So it's pretty much those four things, very simplistic, at the very simplistic level. Artificial intelligence is the mapping of human intelligence onto computers. I mean, that's the basic, basic, basic elements of what that is. The Internet of Things is a little more complex. The Internet of Things is basically how are we, phones, cars, your home, other elements of life going to interact and interconnect with data and information. So utilizing the Internet, data, information to interconnect everything thank That's you RP. yes thank you for that brief uh you know explanation i hope that gives some background to our listeners so that as we discuss these issues they'll have some understanding of what we're talking about so i think the first question i want to talk about is what are, what do you think are some of the strongest applications in the you know emerging tech space right now what what technologies do you think are growing you know the fastest so as far as growth and I think it's kind of in this order. Um, I think uh, artificial intelligence clearly is growing the fastest. It's the one that has been kind of most on people's mind with all these predictive models and all these ways to kind of track and understand data. So I think AI is kind of first, if you think about the bank and when you call a bank, normally you go what I, through what I call the phone weave where that's an AI. McDonald's has a human-assisted AI. So if you go to a McDonald's or even a Starbucks, sometimes 
actually that's an AI taking your order. And then if something happens, then somebody can come on the line and go, hey, uh, you know, did, and they'll repeat it. And you're thinking, well, didn't I just say that? But you were actually talking to an AI there. Um, so AI is fairly prevalent. Um, and I think it's more ubiquitous than most people realize. Uh, the next kind of one that uh, is next is the blockchain. Blockchain is going to start evolving a lot outside of trading and you know cryptocurrency. I think the next kind of set of things to look at is digital money. How is money now going to be deployed and distributed? Identity. How are you going to validate and verify yourself? I think at some point we're going to have to have the conversation about voting. How do you vote? Is your vote going to count? How is your vote going to count? Yeah. Um, and then clearly, uh, there's supply chain and logistics. Blockchain can help track things and validate and verify. Like, yes, this really came from this factory. Yes, this really has has you know been uh, you know uh, this is really organic or certified or something to that effect. So, and then also from an FDA side, if you think about a blockchain, how do you track you know all these different kind of drugs or um, methods or prescriptions or things that are coming out so rapidly, how do you track and validate that those are even great? So, I mean, the blockchain has many, many applications that are going to start to evolve. IoT has been around for a while. It's kind of like the paperless office. IoT has been around since 2000-ish or a little bit earlier. Um, kind of the first set of IoT was a, a low jack. If anybody remembers, like you could kind of call your car and say, where are you? That was kind of one of the very first IOTs. Um, but how has it evolved? Like, really, IOT is there. A lot of people are trying to use it for smart cities, for cars, connected cars. But it's still a little bit late. So I think once 5G comes, yeah. it'll, it'll start to evolve as well. Yeah, and I, and I agree with you. I definitely think AI is a technology that is already moving towards, uh, you know, mass adoption. A lot of companies that I work with are using, you know, AI kind of platforms, you know, running analytic, different kinds of analytics. So I think that is a technology that's already here and it's going to continue to grow and we're going to get even broader adoption of it in new ways. I think right now it may be mostly in analytics that we have it, but we're going to continue to see more development of it in things such as, you know, even a media entertainment, right? We're going to yeah. continue to see increasing deep fake technology that's going to be very accurate. Uh, and, or, and then we're going to have issues about, well, how do we... Is, you is know, that how real? Do we so then the blockchain yeah. can help solve the other half of the problem. Exactly. And, <laughs> and the blockchain, uh, you know, I think is very strong as well. Uh, but it's, you know, enterprise applications like you were speaking about are things that yeah. I see really growing first and getting more adoption. So that is things like retail, which Walmart already has several of these, you know, beta tests being done, for example, with supply chain, with returns, things like that. Um, additionally, some of the government entities have explored blockchain already. So we have the post office who's exploring a blockchain solution we have well the cdc had supposedly done one with blue a couple uh you know when they announced that last year i believe so i think as we get this kind of adoption we're going to see more of that and i think ultimately i see it as all these technologies coming together right you have uh, uh, ai on a you know being recorded on a blockchain on IoT device, using IoT devices well, to get IoT, information. From IoT devices. So yeah. IoT devices will need to have the recording mechanism of the blockchain and AI will kind of be the intermediary between the two. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of, I think, where we're headed. It's uh, going to take, it's complicated in terms of getting people to understand and adopt it and get regulators on board. But I think that's where we're going. Um, what are some of the challenges you see with this, uh, you know, space? Because I kind of see it creates, you know, social, political, ethical, legal implications. Um, you know, for example, we can take, you know, uh, example of, you know, oh, voting cars. Voting would be a huge one. Voting sure. too, yes. Um, huge. Connected cars is huge too. That's more Exactly. AI. Yeah. So with, with, you know, cars, I see, for example, big issues existing with respect to well, programming that goes into this, you know, vehicle, how are they going to make decisions about safety? Are they going to prior, uh, prioritize the, you know, people who are within the vehicle who may be the owners? 
of the vehicle versus you know people who are outside of the you know vehicle if there's an incidence of harm and commercially you know a car manufacturer won't be able to necessarily sell a product that may not prioritize the individual who's purchasing it right so that's that extra right. complexity um, additionally I think that creates liability complexities because you have multiple parties who may be responsible for the decision making right it may not be it's not technically the owner but are they signing on to that liability or does the manufacturer or the developer maintain liability i think they all could potentially have a liability because well, let's say i'm the owner of the car and my car is just being driven mm -hmm. kind of like so i want to make a couple of extra dollars and my car is being driven and so if somebody paid and now an incident occurs it could be just an accident it could be an accident involving a person so there's huge liabilities there who's really responsible now from a programming side that that's another potential liability because if you think about bias and uh, several of the accidents that have occurred already with some of these uh connected cars it's because well we didn't really recognize this type of person or the other, the other thing about those cars is they do have cameras or some type of like mechanism to, to try and discern uh, like where they are, like their location in relationship to either a, a crosswalk or other cars or, or things of that nature. So like really they don't have the same depth perception as a person would have. So the actual reactions to the car how do you really program that in? Like, okay, if I'm like within one foot of a person, should I stop? If I'm over the half a foot of a person, like, how do you really gauge that? And yeah. then because of, of bias in AI, and it's biased in many ways, mm -hmm. uh, how do you make sure like you're not running over just random people? Yeah. And I know that some of the car manufacturers have been exploring having the vehicles actually announce to pedestrians, for example, stop, <laughs> don't cross things like that. And that puts more responsibility on the pedestrian as well. And I'm not sure you can really do that, right? Ultimately, under the law, you at the vehicle, you know, the vehicle owner, the person in charge of the driving is responsible, like the pedestrian yeah. has the right of way. So you can't just change the law by announcing, asking the pedestrian not to move forward because you're worried you may hit them, right? Right, right. So that is uh, well, there's many, many aspects of that. I mean, and then too, the, the other thing is the adoption. Like how is the car going to actually interact with the, with the people that are driving? Because if you think about the actual adoption of a connected car, it's not going to be like all of a sudden, everyone's going to have a connected car. That's not going to happen. There'll always be somebody driving, hand driving. Mm -hmm. So like, how are you even going to interact with regular people on the road, just from yeah. a car driving perspective? Exactly. I mean, and I also think it creates complications as more of this uh, technology uh, gets adopted regarding cybersecurity, right? Because now you're basically putting yourself in the hands of, you know, this technology that can potentially be hacked. I mean, even years ago, you know, I remember in one of the uh, CES back in, I think, the mid or early 2000s, people were able to remotely make a laptop explode. So you think about, well, if there's people who are, you know, very valuable, they are, you know, high political officials, are they even going to use this kind of technology because it creates an extra security uh, risk, right? Yes. Well, and that, that's a huge risk. If you think about cars in general, like I remember the famous Jeep that they just, you know, this was a regular driving Jeep. It wasn't even a special, you know, car. And they just uh, hijacked it and ran it off the road. So mm -hmm. if you can do that with a normal car, can you imagine with a computerized car? Mm -hmm. what you yeah. Do on the security side. Exactly. And then, and then, like, let's say you had some malicious programming in the car. Mm -hmm. right? It's not. It's not only just like let me hack the car. You could also like spread a virus through the car. How are you going to handle that? That's a huge yep. security issue. Yeah. Or if you could do pay in the car, which I'm a, I'm I'm making an assumption. Like, if you want your car to be utilized, like there may be people that want to put ads in there. So like can it get hacked for pay? Like yeah. you know, your car has these uh, ransomwares on it. Like you can't drive your car anymore until you pay me, you know, so like that could be a thing as well. So there's many aspects of the cybersecurity, I think that haven't been thought of. Although if you think about Teslas, which are semi-automated, I, I think they're not, you know, you, they, you could still do the human interaction. Yeah, like, yeah. They haven't had too many of these issues. So I don't know what they're doing there, but I think that's kind of a, 
a lesson as to how to potentially think about doing it. Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of companies right now, I find, don't put the enough, uh, you know, investment into cybersecurity and data privacy, and that's why we see these many of these hacks. How mm -hmm. much do you think the, you know, lack of, you know, we don't hear too much about hacking right now, how much of it do you think it's more from a lack of mass adoption, right? So that's like something we never really heard about, for example, the privacy concerns with Zoom until people started using it on a mass basis. So right. sometimes there is a protection from just a minority of people using it. Um, clearly scale, technology scale can uh, obviously surface many problems, especially with someone like Zoom who like went from almost like zero to infinity, like within two weeks. Yeah. Like, so that's, you know, great for them and great for them as well, like at two levels. But, um, you know, I think that I agree, most companies don't think about how do you go about securing these things, especially from an AI side, AI could be hacked and you could put in malicious code. You know, clearly we've seen, you know, blockchains, the blockchain itself hasn't been hacked, mm -hmm. but the kind of centralized systems around them have been hacked and yeah. those are usually the ones that contain all the money yeah. or the identities. So usually kind of they're going after money or identity yeah. um, or some other data that they feel is, is valuable. So, I mean, if you think about it, blockchains could kind of help preserve some of that. Um, blockchain is actually very interesting because people yeah. can actually embed, you know, uh, ran, you know, people who are not necessarily the miner can embed material that is controversial and illegal yeah. on the blockchain. So there yeah. can be, you know, ransomware, malware, there can be child pornography, there can be uh, state secrets. And so it creates actually potential liability for very um, many miners specifically depending on where they're located so for example in china it's a you know a criminal act with you know, jail time and all that to disseminate state secrets but if someone's embedded yeah. state secrets and you don't know you're now responsible for disseminating it same here i mean supposedly you're supposed to go to jail here as well for disseminating state secrets um so i agree that that creates a whole another liability and then if it's kind of permanent then how do you undo that or how do you do that prior to like mm -hmm. is there a way you can stop that before it's like or, or almost have a moderator okay i moderated this and this is not a state secret so now we're going to put this on a blockchain versus this is a state secret now this needs to go get routed to a human being yeah this is kind of where like blockchain ai and, and things of that nature need to have more conversations like the combination yeah. of the two like who's really governing this who's really watching this who's really making sure that the data that's going on here is clean and exactly. valid and, and legitimate and it's you know that brings up the issue of how do you actually you know punish or hold people liable for this when it is an ai that's doing that analysis you know so uh, you know I, I, we were discussing last week when we were talking you know about how there has been laws that or bills that were put forward in Australia and the US last year that wanted to criminalize with jail time tech executives for their algorithms failing to quickly pick up controversial material uh, on their platform. So for example, this arose relating to the shooting in New Zealand and how uh, Facebook's algorithm was not picking up all of the posting of the videos that should not have been posted quick enough or accurately enough. And mm -hmm. so when you get a situation where you have executives such as Zuckerberg making decisions about, you know, about having to face jail time, they're going to be more, they're going to be stricter on free speech, which basically gives that decision making process to private actors versus the government. And that's something we need to face. And, you know, it's something I'm, you know, not as comfortable with. And I did. I'm not comfortable with that either. As yeah, well, I'm not comfortable with that either. But then it also takes free speech out, you know, like completely out of the individual. Because mm -hmm. like free speech, you know, some people are going to say crude things. Some people are going to say, you know, like how do you, you know, you're just basically going to have everything censored. But like you said, like who is really censoring it? Now it's an AI. Then mm -hmm. what happens if it's like what happened to Facebook? The AI start to talk. Now yeah. we. Have Several AI, now we have what, the Terminator, uh, you know, <laughs> what's the other famous one, I forget. Uh, there's a few other ones, Blade Runner, we got, we, you yeah. know, we're in the matrix, like what, what's happening here now? Mm -hmm. So really you have to think about like, not only 
the AI and the control of the AI and who's controlling the AI, but is now the AI going to become this sovereign entity? Mm -hmm. And, you know, like not only can Mark Zuckerberg not control it, but none of them can control it. Yes. Like zero control there. Yeah. And I think it's very interesting because I think this brings us to a good, you know, point to discuss kind of the you know, social and ethical implications of this. So we can take, for example, a facial recognition software that's using, you know, AI technology. There are, the technology is not advanced enough yet to be able to accurately identify minorities and women on a consistent basis. So there's a big bias there on the technology itself, as well as the fact that the one, the people who are coding it have their own biases that are being built in, as well as the data we're feeding it has biases. So, you know, this has been used, for example, for, uh, you know, supposedly identifying criminals, but as not yeah. only is that data, because the criminal justice system, you know, has biases built in. So it's biased because of that and because of um, the misidentification of minorities in that process as well. Yes, that's a, I actually have a very funny story about this. Uh, so maybe about two years ago, we were, um, I have a, a young son, not so young, but we were out at the mall and it's in a diverse area. And we went to the mall and Microsoft was there with their Xbox mm -hmm. team, their gaming team. And they wanted to have people come in and take pictures for their quote unquote game. And so I had been by there a few times and I was like, you know what? I, I, they said, hey, you want to do this? I said, no, you don't, got, you, no, you guys don't get my face for your AI. Cause I, I pretty much figured out that's what they were doing. Mm -hmm. So my son went in there and he came out, it was about half an hour later, he came out and I said, well, how much do they pay you for your face? He goes, $5. Mm. So if you think about that, the concept of that, like now Microsoft or one of these big entities has my identity and yeah. for dollars mm -hmm. and because they're trying to undo the bias or I don't really know like what they were doing but if you think about it like now they have your identity so mm -hmm. like what else what other aspects of your identity you know do you want big tech government or other people to have of you you yeah. know I'm not going you know we we have the ability to take some tests around here I'm not going to go do that I said they have my DNA why do I want to have them do that oh well, yes like you know what I'm saying it's just like and then what are you going to do with my DNA? And then mm -hmm. is this test even real? Like that's where blockchain is required. So like, I mean, there's so many issues around that ethically about what, and then you talked about deep fakes. Okay. Now they could take my picture yeah. you know, even here on zoom and now I can be a deep fake. I can be saying some other things, mm -hmm. it's like, but that's not me. That doesn't even sound like me, but yeah, it's you because that's you digitally. No, that's not me digitally that I wouldn't say that, but you know, so now you're getting into these, conversations and then legally I'd love to hear like how do you even like if there was a deep fake of me that was doing these other things that were probably maybe illegal or maybe unethical or maybe yeah. you know, was like doing these uh you know SEC pitches that I wasn't supposed to be doing and it's like but that's not me like how do you combat that as a person yeah and I think that's going to be some of the difficulty because uh you know I haven't yet heard of good ways to kind of like a good deep fake to be able to establish it's not really accurate, right? Because a good one actually looks like the person, sounds like them, right? Mm -hmm. So that's actually going to create complications because, you know, one of the areas we're going to, I think, see this is in politics. Like yeah. we're going to see a lot of deep, like as this technology kind of takes off, we'll, we will see candidates saying things that they may not have said. And so now the burden is on them to miss, you know, basically, unprove it at least in the court of public opinion so i think it's right. going to create more misinformation and more you know misleading of voters and it's going to be kind of exasperate the problems we've already seen that arose with cambridge, cambridge analytica mm -hmm. uh kind of and what we're still seeing today that there are very people are able to be manipulated through the data that's gathered on them and then analyzed through a lot of these algorithms and then they are sent you know targeted basically political ads uh even though they're not aware that it's necessarily an ad and then they vote based on that and that's something they click on it and they get other information because they they've created it as clickbait mm -hmm, yeah and so it becomes this kind of cycle of then they, that they get fed into it and then they get more of that information and i think it becomes hard for them to kind of escape it sometimes I agree.
So you kind of almost have to turn your phone off at some levels, like just <laughs> you know, stop watching social media. So. But then too, I mean, that kind of makes you uh, not know what anything's going on, fake or real. You know what I'm saying? That's like, very that, true. that makes it difficult. Like if you don't understand all, actually what's going on in the world as well. So, you know, AI can bring about many, many very interesting uh thought processes and, and things to think about as far as, you know, ethically, politically, and even individually, like how is this really going to impact us as an individual and a person? Yeah, I think it's definitely going, to, and you know, there's, there's interesting parts about it too. There's already, for example, AI that's creating music and that has its own kind of complications because, you know, it's this independent entity so, but not really like a legal entity, right? So there's no right. person who's involved in creating that intellectual property. So who does that intellectual property uh, kind of belong to now, right? Does it belong to the developer, the person who purchased the AI? Uh, does the AI get to establish some kind of you know property right? So I think those are issues that are very important to be addressed in the agreements between the different parties who are transacting in this space, because I, you know, IP and how IP is treated and how data is treated is very important issues that I address for my clients and the transactions that they undertake, because that's where a lot of the crux of how these areas grow and how people actually are able to preserve their rights and their companies. Exist. And not only that, that's their value. Like your intellectual property is, you know, a lot of your value, especially early on. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I mean, really, it's very important to understand some of these issues, like how do you protect it? How do you make sure that, that it's, um, it's sound and, and that it can evolve? Also, like, how does it evolve? How does it evolve over time? Exactly. So that those are things you need to protect in your transactions. And uh, just because some of these issues are gray does not mean you sh should not be putting in the forethought and, you know, drafting agreements that actually put forward the best argument for your position, right? Yeah. So just because it's gray doesn't mean it's a wild west. I think people sometimes get confused and think, you know, like to say it's a wild west and blockchain and all that. But yeah, it doesn't mean there's oh, a AI as well. I mean, AI exactly. as well, but, you know, like really, I mean, we touched a little bit on the ethical things, but how do you codify that on a on, on, in an agreement or in a document that's difficult as well so you know and and like you said who's really responsible who even a blockchain if you're really a truly decentralized network and you're in every country or you're in multiple countries who's really responsible for that and that's where you know for example with blockchain there is complexities regarding uh, where like where you even are potentially being called into court and so if yeah. you don't address some of these issues on the front end in your agreements you're left with this legal mess that's going to cost a lot more to litigate than in a normal situation because now you're for example having to litigate the issue of what law even applies what country's law applies and where you have to litigate uh jurisdictionally this if you're a startup, this could put you out of business because you could be looking at hundreds of thousands of dollars fees versus if you had set an agreement in the front end that addressed some of these issues uh, so that you at least had a, a straightforward, more straightforward argument to make if you're called into court. 100%, very important. 100% uh, agree. Jurisdictionally, you have to understand. And, you know, I mean, from, your, from a startup perspective, you absolutely want to pick like what jurisdiction is going to be I don't want to say friendly, but friendlier than other ones. So you kind of have to do a lot of homework if you're going to, even AI, AI has, has various things as well, as far as block, and blockchain as well, and IoT as well. So you have to look at all these advanced emerging tech things and kind of see jurisdictionally how you're going to set it up. Or if you're set up here in the United States, how would you expand yourself jurisdictionally? Like, where should I go first? What's most friendly? So you can kind of, keep the synergies around your IP and, and all the, all these con great contracts you made here. Exactly. And IP is very uh, jurisdictional itself. So yeah. IP is not like a, a, you know, similar across different countries. The laws are very different. So that's why it is important to, you know, be having, having that forethought for both your IP and just your transaction in general. So you're protected. Okay. okay I think since we're kind of, you know, having about 50 more minutes, well, I want to move on to maybe discussing what are you, uh, how do you think this whole COVID pandemic is affecting the this space? 
I kind of find that I think there's growth in certain areas. So I think med tech is growing, for example, we have telehealth, we have, you know, analytics for hospitals or different things that are growing at this time. Um, I also think a lot of new businesses are starting to grow because that's kind of what happens during recession. So we had, for example, Uber and Airbnb come out of their last recession. So it's a time period where we're seeing a lot of uh, people kind of being, since they have now had this opportunity to do their dream forced onto them taking advantage. What do you think, Barbara? <laughs> well, <laughs> you're forced to do your dream. So I've, I've kind of seen two, two things. Either people are kind of, well, not at this point, hopefully that everyone's a little bit out of it. But when it first kind of went, ha when it, this first kind of happened to COVID-19, everybody was kind of shock and awe. So everybody was trying to think about what should I be doing? And a lot of people were then forced to be remote or start utilizing some of these other technologies. So I, I agree that med tech clearly has gone up. Pharmaceuticals, if you look at that, if you think about supply chains and, and logistics, that's, you know, huge. If you think about all the, you know, transportation type of companies, the Uber Eats, the DoorDashes, the, you know, the Instacarts, like if you think about all the online e-commerce companies uh, and then the big tech, like we're still using email, we're still using Zoom, we're still using phones, we're still, yeah, so, you know, internet's still fairly good. My internet's pretty good. Not everyone's internet's good, but mine's pretty good. But um, so if you think about the types of companies that have been successful, um, those are the types of companies that, that benefit. But then how then can, have they been using these technologies to evolve? Well, I know of several types of companies that are trying to build blockchains in to help distribute money to underserved communities. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we've all been getting these quote unquote checks and, you know, businesses have been trying to get checks and people have been trying to get checks and then there's unemployment issues. So like, how can you really distribute money in a better and more economical way and faster? So that's kind of one set of things I've been, we've been looking at. Um, so there's some companies coming up in that space. Um, the second set of companies are kind of like, how do you go about tracking and distributing goods? So there are some more supply chain logistics companies, distribution, how do you distribute things in a more uh, clearer way? And not only from, from that side, it's mm -hmm. also the side of, I trust that this came from where it said. Mm -hmm. Because with the COVID-19 now, they're saying, okay, the beef is having a problem, this is having a problem, this you know, these uh, chickens have meats having a problem. Well, if meats having a problem, let's, let's like use Walmart as an example and go, hey, Walmart seems to think their chickens are good from wherever they're getting their chickens from. So why is that? Because they have tightened up their supply chain and said, okay, you have to use this blockchain to make sure that we validated you as our vendor of chicken and then we can distribute it in our store. So if anything happens, we know like, hey, cut that line off. And so that's another way. Now, from the medical side, clearly, we've heard a lot about models and, you know, how many people are going to die with this model. And we were having all this tracking with models. Clearly, the data in those models were wrong. <laughs> but, I mean, that is a clear AI thing. And, and the thing that that's showing is there is bad data in those kind of models as well. Or if you don't have enough data or if you don't have enough accurate data the models are only as good as the data you put into them. So you can do all the predictive AI you want, and it's great, but if your data is bad, then you're gonna get bad results or results that are very, very off. So that's, that's kind of a lesson out of this as well. Yeah, I think that one thing that I think is interesting is that a lot of industries that may have been, you know, traditional industries or sometimes don't understand tech, so are a little more hesitant sometimes to adopt some of this technology, I think, this has created opportunity to more for them to be more open to it, to more adopt the technology to try to resolve and create more efficiencies in a lot of these areas. So I think that's really exciting because I think you may be getting uh, quicker adoption that you than you would otherwise get just because people, uh, you know, are getting a, you know need the assistance more quickly, so they're willing to explore something they may have been more wary about before. So I think that is. Uh, uh, definitely an exciting development for some of these spaces and some of this technology. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so what kind of trends do you see or when do you kind of think mass adoption is likely to happen for some of these technologies? 
I think, I think the block, I th well, I, I already believe AI is fairly mass adopted globally. I mean, there's, you know, if you think about China, I've been there. If you think about Europe, I've been there kind of, they're actually more advanced on their pay system as well. And I'll, I'll, talk, about that. I'll talk about that in, in a second, but yeah. as far as AI, we're a little bit more advanced, but I think they're starting to come along on the AI side. As far as pay is concerned, like everywhere else is way more sophisticated on pay. I think they got more mass adoption of blockchain, more mass adoption of how you distribute digital money. How do you go about making sure, you know, tracking things? If you think about their data collection, like I've, I've seen in other countries, we haven't done that here, but like in, in Europe and in China, they've been using drones to track things like, are you really social distancing? Are you really like, you know, doing curfew? Are you really, you know, they'll send blasts of music or what have you. So, you know, that's another collection of data that, you know, we, we haven't seen here in the United States yet, but could be coming soon, don't know. Yeah, I mean, I think so that's really an IoT thing. Yeah, I think it's very interesting because, you know, we our data is being collected and we don't we don't even understand how much data is being connected. I think the average person doesn't understand how much data they're giving away. We're just not getting um, we're, we don't get as much clarity in what data is being you know, collected on us and we don't get any benefit of, of it at, from it at all. And cool. so some of these the minimal benefit. Exactly. Yeah. Minimal benefit. Um, but the, you know, for example, in some of these Asian countries, they are being very aggressive with contract tracing. So, yeah. you know, I've seen in China, they're having QR codes on people's phones that they scan whenever they go to a grocery store or whatever. And it tells them if they've come into contact with someone who tested positive for the virus. So they're able to be aware quickly that they need to quarantine or they need to go to the hospital. And that's something where, you know, that data is already generally collected on us, not through, you know, a QR code, but we do have tracking systems on our phones, right? It knows where we are Absolutely. down to the second. I don't think people realize that, but Absolutely. You know, yeah, Apple. Very first tracking device. A lot exactly. Of, a lot, you know, it's, it's very interesting because I know the other thing that's been kind of going around is about these vaccines and then the vaccines, we're going to have a chip and everybody's scan you. And I said, you know what? I really don't think that'll ever happen because we already have the ultimate scanner. It's called the cell phone. And we've had it for many years. And I, I, I know because I was in that business for a very long time, like there's a lot of data. I mean, they know where you are. They know who you're talking to. They know who's texted you. They have all the information on your communications. Yeah. Uh, you know, so I'm like, I, I don't know why everyone is, you know, we kind of gave that up at some levels. And then, like you said, now with all the big tech, there's another level. And then now medically, there's going to be another level. Because mm -hmm. if you're going to really say, okay, here are these drones, or I'm going to take your temperature, or I'm going to scan this QR code, and now I can contact trace you. And now I know the last, I don't know, 70 people. I don't even know what the limit's going to be. 10 people, 70, like what's the limit? Infinite yeah. number of people yeah. that I come in contact with. So yeah. really, there's that ethical issue too. Like, is there going to be a limit on that? Yeah. Well, I mean, I don't even know if we're going to get there, unfortunately, because we don't, you know, I think people are still concerned about privacy because they don't understand how much is actually being gathered. So we're not necessarily going to get that benefit of having some kind of contract tracing program in place to help us be, you know, able to open up more efficiently. So I think we're still struggling with that issue here uh, in our country versus where other countries you know, maybe maybe because they're not democracies necessarily have kind of accepted the issue that the you know the fact that there is, this data is out there and and in those countries at least the government has that control versus with us and maybe among private entities that have this data that then can sell that data. So, um, which is you know un uncomfortable when you think about it, especially when you think about um, how you know so this data is claimed to be anonymized. But it's very easily able to be, yeah, de-anonymized by, you know, basically comparing the data among different places where the data has been gathered, right? Then you have to ask yourself, like, okay, we're, we're talking about big tech, but, you know, like, what about the actual hospital medical system? Mm -hmm. Like, they, now, are they going to start playing in this area of, okay, I've collected all this data are they now going to be the ones in control of the contact tracing? Are they going to be, you know, it's kind of like, if you think about it, how is this really going to work from a, you know, an in, as an individual, yet again, like you said, giving up data, yet more data about you, and now yeah. kind of a little bit more in a personalized way. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, and I, I think- I mean, if I had COVID-19, do I really want everybody knowing? And then like, you know, like how are they gonna distribute that? And then they're gonna, you know, if, if one of my friends was around me and I had it and they're like, oh yeah, okay, I was in contact with, you know, like now you're wondering, yeah. How, how is that going to work? Like actual like notification of that too. Yeah. I mean, in the, in, I know in the Chinese example, it just turns like you, you have, it's green when you're good. And then if you've run into someone who's had it, it turns yellow or red. So it's the basic rag. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So it doesn't tell you like who it was or anything. It just gives you that kind of color notification. So you know that, okay. You and then know, you have no idea. It could have been anybody. It could have been anyone, but you know, yeah. yeah, it could have been anyone, but you know, you've been exposed. So at least, you know, to take precautions to kind of quarantine yourself or seek and seek medical help as necessary. So there's probably ways to do it. I mean, it's probably more, it makes most sense to have the government involved, right? Because at least they have some social account, uh, social and political accountability, right? We can always sure. vote to get them out versus with the entities, the private entities, we don't really have control. They're ultimately just responsible to themselves and their stockholders, right? True. So less, and then- There's I think no public pressure on that. In yeah. The, yes. Well, that's actually interesting. Yeah, like a lot of these, uh, these companies will do anything. We kind of saw that with the small business loans, right? A lot of these big yes. companies ended up taking loans that were meant for small businesses and only returned them after they realized people were angry and were not going to go to their, you know, uh, well, and people, people got mad and they rose up and they started letting people know. But yeah, but why did he even take that? Why did you even do it in the beginning? See, exactly. that's what, like that's the more other other side of the ethical question. Like, exactly. Why did you even do it in the beginning? You knew you weren't a small business. Yeah, but that's that comes down to the whole issue of when you have you're making decisions purely based on revenue and stockholders and decisions that are economical for the business, you're not going to be thinking about the greater public good. And, you know, the government technically, you know, they're not always good at it, but at least they are supposed to be taking those kind of social considerations into place. Um, yeah. I think that also brings us to the currency kind of issue that I want to kind of discuss uh, about before we kind of finish up is that, so definitely a lot of countries, you know, for example, as we were talking in Asia, are already past this, any kind of physical currency. They've all gone fully digital. And they, so that's even a, less of a vector for infection, right? Because there is no physical um, cash that's being exchanged. There is no credit cards, for example, even in China, there's just, you know, WeChat. So you just you yeah. have to do it on an app. Uh, additional, additionally, I think that's interesting because you- Same in Korea as well, it's very interesting. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, so I think that's interesting as well as the fact that you now have private entities trying to print money. So you have uh, Facebook and Libra, so they're trying to print their own money. And that creates this tension between uh, really what has historically been nation states and now it is, uh, these, I guess, corporate states. So you have a new kind of power dynamic that's going on and really, again, gets into that issue of private entities making uh, decisions, uh, having the power to make decisions about, uh, you know, social, ethical, economical issues. Yeah, Libra is an interesting one. I'm surprised, you know, like Starbucks is backed. So they're, you know, they have their version um, you know, uh, who else? Overstock was one of the first ones to kind of take Bitcoin. Yeah. You know, they have this lolly. Amazon can take, you know, uh, money. And I'm surprised they, you know, yeah, they have their the coin. And Amazon. Alibaba has the, has the, you know, like you said, WeChat, Alipay. Yeah. And so if you think about these large nation, you know, nation uh, companies, we'll call them, uh, they already do have a lot of power as to how they can, um, interact with consumers or end users or individuals. And so, you know, what's the difference between that and then just saying, okay, we're not gonna take any more Visa or MasterCard, we're just gonna take our own currency. Like, and then we'll just call it a reward, but it's really, you have to purchase stuff to get this quote unquote reward. I mean, really, how do you go about dealing with that as a consumer? And then how, how do you go about interacting between that and a bank or, are you, is there no more banks? Like, are banks going to go away at some point? I, I believe they are, but is the bank going to disappear? And then how do you end up distributing money to anybody at that point? If, if you're kind of at the way of China where it's all digitized anyway, yeah. what do you need a bank for? You can also, uh, 
you know, you get paid from your company directly. You don't need to put it in a bank. You get paid from whoever directly. You don't need to put it into a bank. So the real question is kind of where are all these intermediaries going and yeah. are they going to exist or are they going to disappear? If you think of another thing, we, you kind of mentioned media entertainment, we're in the media entertainment capital, but if you think about movies, you know, now before you had these big theaters and you would go and do these release dates and Universal and one of the movie chains got mad now because they said, we're not going to distribute any more of your movies because they said, well, we made more money distributing it online direct to consumer. Mm -hmm. Well, what's the next step? Okay, so now you erase that currency and now you have movie money. And so how, what does that look like? So the question becomes, how much of this different kind of money are we going to have? Yeah. <laughs> Or is it all gonna be kind of unified money? Because it's interesting, somebody did say this and it was very profound, like money is a sense of like national pride. Like I have a dollar, or I have my ruble, or I have my yeah. you know, yuan, or I have my, you know, my currency. So it is also a sense of national pride. So does that get erased because now it's all digitized? Well, the, and that's where you start losing real power as a nation state, right? Like a lot of people are not necessarily happy with their governments and now you have you know, potential printing of money by these private entities. And so you have more ease of transactions too, because, you know, with, for example, Libra, if you can do international transactions and you can do business with anyone, any part of the world, that's a lot easier than having to do like a Forex exchange as part right. of a transaction and having to pay fees associated with that. So it's creating more ease of business. It's opening you up to a wider potential uh, network of people to do business with. Absolutely. And a lot of people already use Facebook, right? It's uh, what is there's a billion like people a day. Yeah. Kind of crazy yeah. Like that. Exactly. There's like 80 billion users. So why not? Like it's so convenient to be able to use that versus, hey, I have to go to my bank. Oh, I got to do a wire transfer. I got to yeah. do it before 12 o'clock. Got to fill out all these papers. Got exactly. to put these I gotta up. Got to got numbers, right? Like oh, there's all these things yeah. associated with it. Um, Maybe it'll get there tomorrow. Maybe it'll get there in a week. Mm -hmm. And it create it makes it takes it makes business easier, right? And so unless, and that's where the problem arises. It cuts out government as well as these intermediaries. So it becomes everything's it's happening. Like who is the new intermediary? And then the question is, like you said, do you really want a Facebook to have that kind of power? Yeah. Or an Amazon or a Netflix or any you know anyone like that? I don't yeah. know. And then do you just pick one of them, right? Because they all kind of provide similar services. So do you decide, hey, I'm going to use Facebook to kind of store my money and do my transactions. Or someone else says, I'm going to choose Amazon, right? Or do you right. store a little bit with anyone? Have, and do they basically get to run decision-making, right? Because Amazon even had has done a lot of these tests with the facial recognition software for policing. So yep. I, I always joke Amazon's kind of, becoming God. It feeds us, it entertains us, it polices us. All it needs to do is, I guess, provide and make a religion for us and we're, we're it's basically God. <laughs> Who knows, Alexa might be one. There you go. Alexa gets asked that. a lot of crazy questions. I, I, I watch that very carefully. <laughs> that, that's true. <laughs> um, all right, so I'm going to ask us, look at the questions that people ask in beforehand and, you know, see if there's things we can kind of discuss from the questions. So let me pull that up. Ah, so you brought up 5G uh, communications okay. a couple of times. So someone has asked about the consequences of 5G communications. What are your thoughts, Barbara? The consequences of 5G, I'm not sure. That's a very broad and generic question. So I'm gonna say as far as uh, technically, you know, 5G is, um, short wave um, it's a it's a short wave so it doesn't go very it can go far but it can't go through stuff so in order for 5g to be effective it has to be kind of really in an open space and then it also has to be kind of repeated multiple times because it doesn't go far so really 5g is supposed to solve the last mile problem because that's been a problem just like the paperless office forever so you're really supposed to be able to go from like the, you know, broader band 4G to the shorter band 5G and then go into your house quickly. And then that'll give your phone faster speed and data. Now, how they're going to use it, I don't know. Uh, it is very controversial. A lot of people think it causes problems. A lot of people think like, you know, we have the COVID-19 because of the 5G. Like if that was the case, we'd all have the COVID-19. Like that's just 
that because we already have 5G here in LA, FYI. So, yeah, <laughs> so yeah. Like, we would have had that long ago because it's been here about a year. Yeah. Uh, so like really that's some of these things are just myths. So I guess the question is, what is a myth versus what is reality? Mm -hmm. And and so, you know, that's kind of a bigger, broader question outside of tech technology. But I, I think 5G will, it will be fine. I mean, it's already here. Yeah, I think a lot of people uh, unfortunately have fears from a lot of this uh, innovation, right? And it creates kind of issues and complexities with um, adoption of it, right? Because they just don't understand the technology. And unfortunately, a lot of our politicians don't understand the technology as well. So we get a mm -hmm. lot of situations where uh, we are leaving tech to self-regulate and that doesn't always work very well, right? True. Sure. So we do need, uh, you know, hopefully people, I think they can kind of start educating themselves about this and maybe not necessarily fear or something because it's different um, and take some steps to kind of adapt with the times. I think, you know, there were some good programs that had been put in place with the prior administration that funding has been cut to, but hopefully we can restore those kind of programs. For example, there was a program that taught my, uh, basically coding to coal miners. Oh. And that is a really good type of program because it helps them adjust. And I think an issue that we're all going to face is um, increasing. Really interesting. Yeah, so I think we're already seeing it now with, you know, uh, the virus has kind of created this problem, but this is what we yeah. were, we're going to see with adoption of a lot of these technologies like AI, the fourth industrial revolution is going to be exponential. So we Absolutely. are going to have a period of mass unemployment. So we need to be thinking about, well, how do we adapt? How do we address some of these issues? You know, do we need UBI, universal healthcare? Are those things that we need to kind of be able to move forward? Um, how do we yeah, train? That's a, that's a good point. Because if you think about AI, and I always had this vision of like, you know, robots in McDonald's, mm -hmm. you know, I do know there's like a massive burger flipper and fry yeah. flipper at the Dodger Stadium. They cook like mm -hmm. math. Block. So like, if you think about it and you're saying, okay, we want to try and protect people, I'm putting that air quotes, protect people. Yeah. Uh, then like really, then in order to protect people, you don't need people. If you're going to do social distancing and, and try and protect them, then you, you have to think like, how is AI now going to surface at another level where it's more utilitarian? And then what's going to happen with those people, like you said, in their retraining and their uh, re-education and their workforce development, that's going to be a huge, 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 very important. Yeah. So I think this actually, this situation that has arisen, it does provide us the opportunity to address some of these issues head on. And if we can make changes that we maintain, the, the fourth industrial revolution will be less painful on us as we get mass adoption of these technologies. So you know, some of the areas that are going to be kind of adopted more quickly it are like, for example, um, potentially anything that involves the driving, right? If driving is automated, we have less truck drivers, right? So that's a whole yeah. industry that's affected. We have less, you know, drivers maybe for post people that we don't need that. Yeah. Deliveries. The people, yes, yeah. Mm -hmm. at, the, at a scale. You have to think, like, at a scale, that's probably, and I saw that was kind of one of the questions. How would, would there be a push for autonomous vehicles? But I, I think the answer is yes, because if you think about minimizing human interaction with other humans, supposedly, then, like, how do you do that? You have to have more autonomous it, things, period. More autonomous things, period. And now this is where kind of the IoT plays in, into the game as well, because now, you know, how do you know that truck broke down? How do you know the truck has maintenance? The truck can send the maintenance records. The AI can say, well, look, you supposed to be serviced this time, but you drove extra miles. So you really need to go to the service, you know, early, well, a week earlier, or, you know, hey, you didn't fill up in your gas this turn. If you don't fill up, you're going to run out. So you got, yeah. So AI is going to really start uh, and IoT combined would really start showing and servicing more and more moving forward, especially in the logistical places. Mm, yeah. Say, hey, you missed this delivery. Hey, you didn't deliver it on time. Hey, we didn't, you know, because you also have to think like they're going to route. You got to think about the maps and routing and all that. So. Yeah, and I, I think it will create more accuracy. I think all of us have had important things lost in the mail where we have no idea where it's gone. So, you know, I'm excited that the post office is exploring a blockchain application. 
because I'd like to know where the mail goes, <laughs> right? <laughs> so I think those things are um, very important. Um, I, let's see, let's take one more. Let's see what other question okay. there is. Yeah, one more question in here. Yeah. Um, Repeat the four aspects of blockchain and share your insights on how it will influence the financial industry. All right, well, four aspects of blockchain, distributed, not in one place, decentralized, uh, encrypted, private and protected, immutable, permanent record, and then uh, it's a ledger, debit and credit. Those are the four aspects of a blockchain overall. And then, you know, like this is, I think the financial industry is the first practical use of a blockchain. It hasn't had mass, mass, mass adoption. Um, I think the way, it, the, the way I look at mass adoption for a blockchain is more, from a financial perspective is more like, how do you go about distributing money? So now if you look at, you know, we were talking about WeChat, WePay, you know, they got Alipay, they got uh, Pay in uh, Korea, the Pay in uh, Europe, way more sophisticated. If you think about all these more sophisticated countries that from a financial services side, and there are multiple financial services that are far more sophisticated in their financial services and the way they distribute money, I think that could be a, a revolutionary thing here with a blockchain because even if you had to wait one hour for money, isn't that way faster than four weeks, seven weeks, 10 weeks, zero, you know, like infinite awaiting? You know, you, you have to think about the efficiency and the speed up. And yeah. that's kind of what I see as far as distribution. And then also getting rid of some of these middlemen, like do we really, are we really gonna to have to have a bank in the future? What does that mean and what does that look like? Maybe we do and maybe we don't, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, and then I think government, different governments will adapt to it in different ways. So for example, we had China wanting to maintain, make sure to maintain power. So when Libra was announced, they very shortly thereafter announced that they were creating their own digital you know, central coin, basically, that they were distributing to their banks and their, to their manufacturers and all of that. So there was, you know, they were thinking about, there was some talk about a US doing this finally. <laughs> Um, that did not happen, but I think the U.S. needs to consider that, for example, right? If it is going to maintain some kind of uh, control. Competitive advantage as well. Yeah. I mean, and that brings us to the issue of, you know, whether we're falling behind on just in general, like innovation and, and just addressing a lot of what's happening in the world. Like the U.S. isn't really being on the forefront of a lot of these issues any longer, which is, you know, concerning. I agree, and it's very disconcerting, but then you have to think about this is an opportunity back yet yeah, again during like a time like this where new things can come and evolve and new thinking can come and evolve and I don't want to say knock off, but really challenge some of these kind of companies. And the, the thing I see is kind of from all these spaces, like how do you evolve not only uh, uh, you know, technologically, but business model wise? So in the financial services, I kind of see like, okay, we're going to give loans out on crypto. We're going to, you know, we have trading, like we have, a, you know, we want an ETF. We, those are all very, very traditional mechanisms in order to utilize, you know, like use a blockchain or have related to currency. That's nice, but why do we want to do that? Where's the evolution of that? Yeah. Where's the evolution of the models there? Yeah. That's really where you know, someone can come in as a startup and go, well, look, I've created this new business model. I do these five things together and this is really kind of cool. And I've combined all these kind of financial services. I mean, this is really where the real thinking needs to happen. I think like just loaning out on certain things kind of doesn't make sense. Yeah, I think a lot of it's been trying to fit it into traditional, just digitizing traditional models, which, you know, you don't really need a blockchain for a lot of that necessarily. Either. Huh. So. Mm -hmm. That's another thing with just blockchain in general. Do you really need it? Because it's, you know, it's costly to implement. So that's a startup should always consider that. All right. So thank you, Barbara, for joining me and having this discussion. A fun time as always. Thank yeah. you. Thank you everyone for joining in and listening. Uh, again, please uh, look out for the email we will be sending. Well, we will include a survey as well as the information for our next uh, virtual uh, networking event, which will be May 8th in the morning. I uh, look forward to seeing you all there. Uh, thank you. Thank you, guys.